in food production last this year, uh, the, the, the world for the policy makers. And of course, we are also experiencing, uh, uh, as uh, it was already the case last year, deep changes in the way industrialized countries are producing and consuming. Uh, there is this trend towards more natural, more local, more vegetable food in uh, the West. At the same time, developing countries are also continuing increasing their consumption, their demand, and their uh, um, uh, wish to move towards, uh, um, I mean, uh, developed countries' food uh, consumption uh, standards. And on top of those uh, areas, we have this, continues, this continued uh, renewal in technologies, in the way food is produced, but also delivered, marketed, consumed, etc., which changes the global uh, landscape. Uh, we have also, uh, and that would be uh, the last point that I'm going to highlight as an introduction, uh, this uh, threat around climate and this big question whether food is an ally and agriculture is going to be an ally of climate uh, or is it going to be, uh, uh, or is there be going to be a lasting contradiction between producing, producing food and, being, and uh, fighting against uh, climate change? So we have a great uh, group here uh, tonight to address those issues. I'm very happy uh, that uh, Mr. McCullen, Mr. Cullen uh, could uh, reach us, join us again, uh, as it is at least the sec as far as I'm concerned, the second year I have the pleasure to interact with him to discuss those issues. Mr. Cullen is the chief economist of the Food and Agriculture Organization. He has a uh, very broad and long-lasting experience in economics, in development, in agriculture. Uh, Mr. Maximo Torreo Cullen has been um, also uh, has worked at the World Bank Group, he has been the ex where he has been the executive director for several Latin American uh, countries, but he has also uh, led the division of markets, trade and institutions at uh, IFRI, a well-known uh, institute uh, here. So, Mr. McLean, you, you will start this panel by introducing us into uh, the broad picture, and uh, you uh, will be uh, followed by uh, two people who will uh, focus more specifically on uh, areas that are of major importance uh, for our uh, discussion tonight. Uh, Mr. Kabel uh, Abdallah, who is a manager, direct, managing director and CEO of Canal Sugar, uh, an Emirates and Egyptian multi-billion dollar agricultural industrial group, which is operating, uh, among others, in Egypt and which aims to ensure Egypt's self-sufficiency in sugar. Uh, so uh, we, are, Mr. Kamel, for over 20 years, you have led large regional companies in the Middle East with turnaround uh, mandates, and you will talk more particularly about the um, Middle East. Then we'll have the pleasure to uh, turn to uh, Mr. Okulei, Sam Okulei, uh, who is the chairman and chief executive uh, officer of LATC Group, which is a property investment firm in Nigeria, which invests in a variety of uh, uh, areas, sectors, including, of course, agriculture, uh, which you are particularly uh, familiar with, and you will provide us with a private sector uh, vision of what is happening also in Sub-Saharan Africa, as with your uh, grounding in Nigeria, which, as everybody knows, is a critical uh, country for um, agricultural production and the largest African country, uh, of course. And finally, uh, you will turn to Mr. Park Yongju, who is uh, coming from uh, Korea, who is an executive vice president of Plant Farm, a leading uh, indoor vertical farm company. You have uh, Mr. Park, uh, 30 year plus years of experiences in brand strategies, global market marketing management, and product innovation, and with a strong uh, sector specific experience in uh, agricultural production and food industries, which is going to be uh, the issue you will uh, address. You had served previously as the chief marketing officer of Coway and as the Vice President of Global Marketing at Samsung Electronics. 
uh, this specifics of the issues that you will uh, try to address will be also to um, focus uh, on technology and some dimensions at least of technology uh, as our round table uh, tries this year to uh, um, uh, take this angle uh, to give a, a complementary uh, vision uh, compared to what we had uh, discussed last year on those major challenges. So having uh, said that, I'm going to turn right away to uh, Mr. Cullen. Uh, I hope we can hear you correctly. Uh, please uh, go, go ahead. Hi, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we are hearing you very well. Perfect. Thank you so much for, for your kind invitation this, this second year. Uh, and let me uh, try to present where we are and what are the major challenges that we will have in the future and where we need to, to focus uh, enormously. So let me start by, by saying that relative to last year, the news are not uh, what we would have liked to be, meaning that the level of chronic undernourishment in the world remain very high to levels of 735 million people chronically undernourished. And if we project that to 2030, we will be around 590 million people chronically undernourished. Now, if we take out the effect of COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine, we are talking of levels uh, of around uh, 400 or 500, 400, uh, 119 million people less chronic undernourished. If you can pass the slide to the third one, please. You, next. That one. Okay, so basically what this graph is showing, what I was referring is 735 million people chronically undernourished projected to around 600 million by 2030. And there you see the effect of the COVID-19 and, and the war in Ukraine. Next, please. Now, also, if we look at the latest report that we just launched today, and we look at the new hotspots, we see that the situation is not improving at all. Uh, and basically what we are observing is that there is 18 hunger new hotspots comparing to 22 countries comprising 22 countries and 22 and uh, 22 countries and territories. So this puts in a situation where we have countries which are in a very severe situation, a situation which is uh, worse uh, than what we had uh, before, and especially now with the latest events, we have increased those. Uh, now, if we go to the next slide, uh, what is important to, to mention here is that this agri-food system is going into significant problems of risk and uncertainties. And that's what will drive the future of what we are observing. These uh, risk and uncertainties are not only on the humanitarian side, but are also on the macroeconomic side. More than 61 countries in debt distress, problems of exchange rate because of the interest rate increase, and significant linkages of the energy sector with biofuels, but also with fertilizers. And of course, the problem of contamination of land and destruction of land. All that affects directly the agricultural sector through inputs, through trade, logistics, which affects overall production, and that will affect, of course, the prices. And in addition, we have debt stress. But the challenge is that all this is under a lot of stress of water and climate change. And climate change will affect in four dimensions, will affect on extreme temperatures, excess of water, lack of water, variability of the climate indicators, which make more difficult for farmers to make decisions, but also pest and diseases evolution because of climate change. Next, please. Now, in this context of risk and uncertainties, we know that we have passed by now six of the nine planetary boundaries. And what that means, if we move to the next slide, it means that we are moving into something that we don't know. It means that we are moving into biophysical dynamics that are nonlinear and could be exponential. So the frequency of these events could significantly increase over time, and that's something that we need to carefully look at. Because what will happen is what we are observing today in Spain, for example, that the payments to the insurance has doubled or tripled because of the frequency of the weather events. So that is the environment we will be facing. Now, if we go to the next slide, there are four key drivers or transformation drivers that I want to raise uh, pretty briefly. First, the urbanization which will continue and it will continue in space. Second, industrialization. Third, the importance of carbon neutralization, as you were mentioning. 
our belief is that we need good food for today and for tomorrow. And that what means is not only to produce more, more efficiently today with less, but also to be able to make it more sustainable. And that is what brings climate investment towards the agri-food system rather than the reverse. Because the agri-food system has enough, of, enough space to improve substantially and have the major marginal returns in terms of reduction of emissions. And the fourth is digitalization. But let me touch on the first three of those. If we go to the next slide. In this figure, what we see is how urbanization uh, and how is the relationship between urbanization and the share of urban population, total population, and the share of agriculture, including fisheries and fishing, in total gross domestic product. At the global level, the share of urban population grew from 37% in the 1970s to 56% in 2019, while the share of agricultural GDP decreased from 5.3% to 4.2%. And this is substantial, the change that we are observing at the global level. You can see the same in the high-income countries, and then you see in China the big difference of what we are observing uh, today. Now, if we go to the next slide, we also see that the, pro the projection of the population is projected to evolve uh, in the world and high-income countries and China. And in high-income countries, a clear stabilization of population is shown, and even a reduction in the case of China. But this is not what we are observing in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where we are observing a significant increase of the rural population still, and yet not converging like what we are observing in the case of, of China. So this means that urbanization will be a significant challenge, and that's something that we need to look carefully because the demand of the commodities that we will be eating will be varying accordingly. If we go to the next slide. Here, I approximate the industrialization by using the share of agricultural value added in GDP and the share of agricultural employment. As we can see, depending on the region, we can observe different dynamics. And while in the last 30 years, proportionally labor has left the agricultural sector for manufacturing and services, almost everywhere in low-income countries, labor productivity in these sectors has remained almost constant, while it expanded during the structural transformation in high-income countries. Indeed, labor productivity in the rest of the economy has almost stagnated in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, East Asia and the Pacific, while it has barely increased in South Asia and Near East and North Africa. So this shows something extremely important, which is also linked to the informality of these regions and how industrialization will evolve. Now, if we go to the next slide, we will see that the agri-food systems also creates pressures on our environment. And that's something that we need to look carefully. It creates effects because of emissions, 31%, biodiversity loss, water scarcity, and pollution. And those are the externalities. But again, what I am saying is that we need to find a solution to these problems because we need to have good food for today and tomorrow. And if we just focus on the greenhouse gas emissions and climate change in the next slide, we will see that 31% of the global emissions, nearly 50% were from non-CO2 gases and generated within the farm by crop and livestock production activities, 20% by land use, change processes, and mainly deforestation, peatland degradation, and 30% by supply chain. So that's the distribution. So there is enormous potential for carbon neutralization. If we go to the next slide, we will see here that our agri-food systems needs to be transformed to achieve this carbon neutralization. And for this, we need to improve governance of natural resources, improve productivity, this means produce more with less, improve production practices, improve consumption patterns and behavior, and use a cleaner energy. So our I work here and in the figure, what you show in the red bubbles is the size of the problem and in green bubbles, the size of potential sequestration. So there is enormous potential uh, on the bigger problems in the use of energy, in the livestock use, in manure management, in fertilizers and rice to create reduction. And there is enormous potential in land use and forest peatland, but also in soil management to reduce these greenhouse gas emissions. That's why I was saying that the agri-food system could be an opportunity to accelerate this process while at the same time assuring that we produce what we need for today and for tomorrow. And finally, my last slide is just to, to focus about uh, what we can do and, and where we can make a, a difference in this process. And here is where we need to tackle at the same time the emergency situations with an integrated humanitarian peace building policies, but also we need to protect our, house, our households, increasing resilience, and scaling up climate resilience across agri-food systems. 
That's the only way we will be able to address the challenges of water and climate, and the only way we can contribute to the bigger access of healthy diets, because today, 3.1 billion people don't have access to healthy diets. But on the financing part, there are several boxes that we need to look. One is support agriculture and how we can repurpose that, how we can accelerate and promote better incentives of the use of that support to agriculture, and that's the repurposing agenda. The second one is, of course, out of the public sector, but it's the private sector, the international financial organizations, and the other traditional donors. So that's the way we need to allocate resources in the proper incentives. Next week, on the 6th, we are launching the first issue of the True Cost Accounting of Food, which will bring a lot of insights and information of where these incentives should be aligned to minimize externalities from agriculture towards this idea of good food for today and for tomorrow. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Cullen, for providing this uh, broad vision uh, and concluding especially on the uh, policy directions that we have to, to take. One point that uh, I also take from your last slide is that you are using several times the word healthy diets, which means also something that I did not say in my own introduction, that agriculture is also part of our health agenda and uh, which includes also uh, changes in the way we produce food, but also in what type of food we eat and how we consume it. So thanks so much for providing this big picture. Now we are going to uh, dive more specifically on two key regions. Uh, Mr. Okulei, uh, Sam, uh, let's start with you, please. And uh, thank you for sharing your, your vision of uh, what Africa is, uh, uh, of the African situation, but also your own experience as an investor uh, and providing us with uh, your, this, this experience of a private stakeholder. Absolutely. Um, thank you, everybody. And of course, uh, great to be here again for the second time in a row. And I'm just going to take uh, from where Mr. Cullen stopped, and which is the impact of geopolitics on food production, food consumption, nutrition, um, on emerging markets, especially the vulnerable emerging markets like, like Africa, for example. And the, the essence of this is why governments in uh, Africa and especially other vulnerable emerging markets should, should care, should care about what is happening in the rest of the world. Uh, from Russia-Ukraine crisis or to lately the Israeli uh, uh, Gaza conflict or uh, as the case may be, what is happening between the United States and China, between uh, India and China, or as the case may be. And I think the most vivid example of why this is, is, is important is last year when we started to see the crisis that started in Sri Lanka as a result of you know, the crisis in, in Russia, Ukraine, uh, what started to happen in Africa, in many parts of Africa, um, with the uh, impact of what is happening in those parts of the world on food production in uh, some of these vulnerable uh, markets. And we say vulnerable because it's interesting to learn that uh, for many countries in Africa, the staple foods, the staple diets in these countries are still imported. Whether it is bread, which is consumed in many parts of Africa, and main ingredient being wheat, and wheat you know, coming from uh, Ukraine and Russia, for example, uh, whether it's in maize, corn, which is a very staple in Africa, and it is net imported uh, into Africa today, uh, or whether it's even cassava, for example, in West Africa, which is not just a staple, but a base ingredient for a lot of the products that are consumed uh, in, in Africa beyond food and um, uh, beyond uh, nutrition. So the interesting thing to note here is, for example, why these countries should start to care and why protectionism happening in many parts of, of the world starts to impact um, on uh, countries like, uh, like Africa, for example. And there are very interesting themes that start to happen, and it's interesting that Mr. Colin has pointed out a lot of them in, in his presentation. And, you know, some of these very interesting themes that start to happen is, for example, protectionism. Uh, we've seen, for example, the, the uh, uh, ban by uh, India on rice exports and how that starts to have a very important impact in countries like Nigeria, for example, Kenya, all over Africa, where rice has become uh, a big staple. 
And uh, the interesting thing that protectionism starts to, to do is that it starts to make food a weapon. Uh, because there is social unrest in these countries as a result of these situations. Uh, there is a lot of uh, problems that start to, to come out of it, like migration. I mean, we start to see a lot of people uh, migrating from Africa into, into Europe and the Mediterranean Sea now becoming uh, uh, almost a, a cemetery, if you like. And 12 out of the 54 countries in Africa have declared a food emergency this year as a result of the protectionist or the inflationary or the uh, geopolitical impact of what is happening in other parts of the world other than, than Africa itself. So it's important to point out things like you know, health challenges, uh, food as a weapon, uh, protectionism, inflation, and so on and so forth, you know, being the consequential effects of geopolitics in these parts of the world. Now, following this then is what should African countries or what should these vulnerable emerging markets start to look out for or start to do in order then to make sure that food security becomes uh, a focal point of their policy agendas in order to make sure that there's not only a secure and, and peaceful environment in these countries, but that there is a very healthy population in, this, in these parts of the world. And I think the first thing that starts to become very important is, uh, first of all, building resilience in the supply chains or building resilience in, in uh, uh, the infrastructure that allows you know, for these countries to make sure that they get food back home. And this can, can go all the way from nearization or localization of these supply chains to make sure that uh, urbanization is good, uh, of course, but urbanization, of course, does not have to come at the cost of uh, depleting agricultural uh, uh, lands or depleting investments in agricultural practices to boost production uh, of food in, in uh, uh, these parts of the world. Next to that is technology, research, digitization, if you like. And it was very interesting in some of the presentations that we saw earlier today. If you go around supermarkets here in the Middle East, you find tomatoes, you find cherries, you find berries and the kinds of things that you would never expect to, to grow in this part of the world now being grown here uh, in the United Arab Emirates, for example. And that has gone a long way in securing uh, the, the food uh, system in these parts of the world. And this is something that African countries then have to start to put a big focus on to ensure that you know, there is localization and there is near, nearization, if you like, uh, of production basis, and this has to be held by technology. It has to be held by research, uh, conservation of water, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, there is diplomacy and multilateral engagement, uh, and for uh, countries in Africa to start to understand that there is every reason to care about what is happening in other parts of the world, that a war in Ukraine is not just a Ukrainian and Russian problem that uh, the, the face-off between uh, India, for example, uh, and uh, China is not just an India-China problem, or that the, the global uh, trade dispute between the United States and China is not just a United States and China problem. That, of course, it's a global village today, and it's very important that uh, diplomatic relationships or multilateral efforts at solving these problems, either from a regional perspective, ECOWAS, or an African Union perspective, is key uh, and important in making sure that we keep a big focus on uh, all of these. Of course, there is targeted uh, fiscal and monetary policy. Inflation is a big issue today, and inflation is a big issue in these parts of the country uh, in these parts of the world that I'm talking about, not just from uh, a local perspective, but also from a, a global perspective. There is the impact of the fact that, like I said earlier, almost all of the staples in African cuisine and diets today is imported. You have the double whammy of uh, um, uh, the deterioration of the currencies in, the, in these parts of the world vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the US dollar, that is the currency that you require, or euro, or as the case may be, to make sure that these imports are, are brought in. And of course, the inflationary effects of it, the energy costs, and, and so on and so forth. 
And last but not least, there is, of course, the key importance that has to be paid to sustainability and sustainability finance or climate finance, because, of course, we have to preserve uh, the production systems in these parts of the world. It's very important that governments start to make sure that climate-related finance or sustainability-related finance is paid a very important uh, uh, attention uh, because, for example, uh, the kinds of resources that we need to make sure that food production is, uh, is uh, kept at its premium is extremely important, whether it is water, whether it is uh, uh, forestation, or as the case may be, is, is paid a very keen, uh, uh, keen attention to. Now, uh, in summary, the, the essence of this is to start to understand, of course, the impact of geopolitics on, on you know, food systems. And these are some of the very important things that, that need to be done in order to make sure that these countries have a very, very keen focus on why it is important to start to care about what's happening uh, uh, in, in the rest of the world. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Okulhi, and uh, also for helping us making uh, one step further after Mr. Cullen's presentation and highlighting uh, how intertwined are the issues and uh, how uh, uh, geopolitics uh, and food security uh, have uh, tight relations. Uh, and. Um, <clears throat> It's not only about producing and consuming in Africa, but also managing the relationships and caring about what happens in the rest of the, of the world. And uh, I suspect that we are going to face uh, now a, a different situation. Uh, Mr. Kamel in uh, the Middle East, uh, which has uh, strong specificities, uh, including uh, environmental speci and geographic specificities in this uh, major channel. and. Uh, here we are at uh, the right place to discuss those issues. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure if the presentation is up and running, but even without it, uh, first, thank you all for still being with us. I know we stand between you and your uh, breaks for the evening. Uh, it's indeed a very important uh, topic, especially in the Middle East. The good news for the Middle East is that uh, national food security has been an item for at least the last 30 years in the Middle East. Um, while it's becoming a hot topic around the world, we've been dealing with it for, for a long time. But there has been major changes uh, over the years, especially over the last almost uh, eight years in terms of how we look at uh, national food security. Let me highlight my contribution here is that I come from the private sector. However, the role or the projects we do is, are in public-private partnerships with the government. For example, in Qatar, uh, a couple of years back, we flew in cows by plane, first airlift of cows. We work within one to two years to ensure 100% self-sufficiency uh, of dairy uh, products in Qatar. Today, as was mentioned, we are working in Egypt to again ensure self-sufficiency in, in sugar uh, by uh, doing land reclamation for a land as big as Singapore, desert land while using uh, disruptive or new technologies in this. But let me look at food security. Historically in the region, it was easy. It was about availability, affordability, accessibility. And essentially, governments would import it because only 3% of our land overall are fit for agriculture. Almost 97%, depending on the country that you are in, uh, is not, does not have the soil or the water needed for you to do agriculture. Uh, government had lots of money, so they can import and subsidize food programs around the uh, region. For example, in Egypt, 70 million people receive some kind of food subsidy for, uh, for bread. 70 million out of about 110, 120 million people. So, but this uh, model is not sustainable. You know, oil prices will not always go up. We heard earlier today they will start maybe going down. Uh, governments cannot continue to run uh, budget deficit. And we had another complication, really, which is the health crisis in the region. We have the highest, or the second highest, diabetes rates around the world. So what happened over the years is that diabetes, uh, heart problems start coming early. We have them at ages of, in the early 40s versus 50s in other parts of the world. Again, government responded by spending money on healthcare, 
putting the hospitals, sending people first abroad, then putting hospitals in. And now they realized also it's not sustainable. It's neither sustainable to subsidize imported food, nor is it sustainable to continue spending money on treating sick people from chronic disease. And that's now where food security has graduated into. It's about wellness, nutrition. It's not about now making, let's say, poor people or rich people uh, just having food in their tummies. It's about making sure they have the right food in their tummies so that they do not get sick, so that I don't have spent too uh, money on them buying insulin for their sugar, sugar problems. So when you have this change in food uh, security approach in the region, which said we need now to have good food, we cannot continue to import it expensive for many reasons, and we cannot continue to have people eating unhealthy food. So now we are working to ensure we have some kind of self-sufficiencies or at least a reasonable a domestic component production of agriculture. And that's what we are seeing things happening. What made this happen? Technology, pure and simple. Without disruptive technologies, we would not have been able to reclaim the desert. We have disruptive, uh, without disruptive technologies, we wouldn't be able to optimize the production and the use and minimizing the use of water. And without uh, these uh, technologies, we wouldn't be able to develop higher yields for cows, higher yields uh, for, for sugar, higher yields in every area of the agriculture side. Do we face challenges? Indeed, many. The public sector has different expectations from the private sector. Major mismatch between the public sector and the region and the private sector. Goals, expectations, timelines, return on investments. Add to it another component. We really need uh, always R&D, research and development, and our regional companies, and I've run two of the larger ones in agriculture, do not have the funding to do significant R&D investment. So we need the third component in the public-private partnerships, which are universities. The universities in the region are well-funded. I was an ex-academic, but regretfully, uh, a lot of the academia is fo are focused on having a higher research index than maybe having a relevant uh, research. Uh, we know in the industry, whenever we mention academia, they say, watch out, these people uh, do research that prove that blind people do not drive. You know, and we say, of course not. They have a relevant impact for research. We just need to tie them with the food security, the government, the policy making, and the, and the private sector. So where we stand today, uh, it's the best of days, because now food security is the end topic. No longer are investors chasing more buildings and more real estate and people are looking at investing in agriculture, but also it's the toughest times. Indeed, as was mentioned, when you are looking at one healthy earth, uh, you know, one healthy water, one healthy soil, one healthy food, all of this will contribute to one healthy human. And we have several bottlenecks nowadays, especially when we add the regional geopolitical situation. The tensions that used to be here are coming back very fast. And they are driven and will be driven increasingly by agri-issues or water issues. For example, the water issues will impact the Turkey, Syria, Iraq food supply and agriculture, as well as the Ethiopia, Sudan, uh, Egypt water, water supply. Add to it, all these countries use common underground water. And increasingly, as we do land reclamation, we are using or maybe overusing the underground water. So we're ending up with a lot of issues there. Uh, hopefully, technology will come to the rescue. Instead of having lots of cows to get meat, we get our energy from alternative proteins so that we'll have less cows, less gas emissions, and uh, we'll be able to have also healthier, uh, healthier uh, food in the process. So let me uh, stop here and we'll wait for the Q&A, except to, to repeat uh, that technology has been a saver for the region on food security and that the region has been among the pioneers in promoting nutrition and healthy nutrition now as a direction instead of just more food uh, for people. Okay. Anyway, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Kamel, for all those messages and uh, two of them, uh, which I think we'll uh, all uh, re remember, a message about health and the situation of diabetes and heart diseases. By the way, something which is also taking place in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which is also experiencing this major change in health uh, challenges. 
and also this call for technology and uh, science as a, a driver for sustainable uh, food production. And I suspect that we are going to continue digging into this issue with Mr. Park, uh, which uh, I hope will have uh, his uh, uh, <laughs> presentation on the, <laughs> on the screen. No, no uh, I don't think I will have a presentation. Uh, so, so, you know, my, my background is marketing, and I used to prefer like a show and tell, but some technical difficulty, I am not able to show some, you know, good uh, images. So I will focus on the, the telling the story. So the, the question is, you know, the Controlled Environment Agriculture, CEA, whether uh, this technology can be the solution to, you know, food crisis or food shortage, right? I was really glad to hear uh, the, the UA Minister of uh, Climate Change actually mention about uh, she's strong support of, uh, you know, CEA technology because, uh, you know, Middle East is the area many uh, CEA companies are actually focusing on to really uh, deploy uh, their technology. But when you really think about uh, food shortage, there are many different uh, dimensions. You know, the first one would be whether you can have enough food for the, the human uh, races on Earth. Or, you know, some countries, they really uh, worry about, uh, you know, food sufficiency and then uh, self-sustainability. This uh, self-sufficiency issue came out a lot uh, after pandemic, when there is a disruption in uh, trade, and then also like the regional conflict like uh, Ukraine war. Those are actually causing uh, you know, the issue with uh, self-sufficiency. And then if you really think about uh, you know, different countries and different regions, you know, each country or different regions has uh, different needs for, uh, you know, controlled environment agriculture. One example would be, like, think about Antarctica, right? The, the most cold climate on Earth. There is no, uh, you know, plant. But uh, currently, the Korean researchers in Sejong Research Center in Antarctica, they are growing, you know, the watermelons, you know, cucumber, pepper, and tomato, all different kinds of fruits and vegetables in uh, container farms. And those researchers are not uh, really uh, farmers. They don't know how to grow uh, those vegetables and fruits, but all the system is actually monitored from central location in Korea, and then the expert in that monitoring uh, room is providing instruction to the researcher. So the, the result is, you know, they can really enjoy fresh uh, fruits and vegetables so that uh, improving their well-being, but also, uh, you know, by uh, cultivating those greens in, uh, you know, cold place like Antarctica, it's also good for their mental health as well. And another example, cold uh, example is like Mongolia. I know uh, many controlled environment uh, agriculture companies, they are really focusing on hot uh, weather. But, uh, you know, the Mongolia has, uh, Mongolia has been importing 40% uh, of their uh, vegetables and then almost 95% of fruits from uh, other countries. When I visited Mongolia, the quality of uh, the leafy greens are really, really bad. You know, uh, I visited their, you know, very premium supermarkets, but uh, the leafy green quality is, uh, you know, as poor as I almost cannot, uh, I almost don't want to buy it, right? And then if I, when I ask Mongolian consumers uh, whether they consume uh, vegetables, and they say yes, and then I ask what kind of vegetable they consume, they say it's uh, like uh, toma uh, potatoes, you know, sweet potatoes, and like, uh, you know, it's all uh, root greens. You know, for them, they never, uh, you know, enjoyed eating uh, the leafy greens. So one of the projects uh, being uh, conducted in uh, Mongolia with support from a local Mongolian company and then the Ulaanbaatar city is building an indoor vertical farm uh, near outside of uh, Ulaanbaatar and then producing uh, 70 tons uh, of uh, leafy greens uh, every month. So, 
we strongly believe uh, this will uh, improve the, the health of uh, Mongolian consumers, right? And another example is uh, the Northern Canada. Uh, the one uh, city in Northern Canada, uh, they have a very high uh, obesity and then diabetes rates among uh, you know, young uh, kids. The reason is, the, again, is the they don't have chance to eat uh, leafy greens and fresh vegetables. So the local city actually uh, called uh, help for support to uh, Korean uh, the Institute, the KIST Korean Institute of Science and uh, Technology. So what they have done is they actually developed uh, the vegetable called uh, bak choi uh, in an uh, indoor vertical farm. And we call uh, that bak choi as super bak choi. That's because bak choi has uh, some special ingredients which help, uh, you know, uh, reducing uh, fat, uh, fat from the body and then also uh, reducing the obesity. And the KIST was able to develop bak choi with a uh, 2.4 times higher uh, ingredient, which, uh, the ingredient in the bak choi. And then they also uh, able to produce bak choi two times uh, as fast as you know, uh, traditional farming. So those are the some uh, you know, examples in the uh, cold country, right? And in a hot country like in Dubai, as uh, the minister of UAE said, they are already uh, using uh, controlled environment agriculture in here, right? For producing tomatoes, you know, blackberries, you know, and leafy greens. But uh, another project uh, currently being undertaken in uh, UAE is actually producing uh, the animal feed in indoor vertical farm. I found a statistic saying the Abu Dhabi is second, uh, large, second country in terms of importing alfalfa. And they are importing alfalfa from like US and uh, also in China. And their import of alfalfa has grown, I think, 35 times, and 35% for the uh, past 10 years. But think about you know, producing alfalfa in the US, and then you have to dry the alfalfa so that you can actually transport to UAE. And then once you get alfalfa in UAE, now you have to add water into the alfalfa and then mixing uh, animal uh, feed and then feed to the cow, right? So I, I hope I can produce alfalfa from indoor vertical farm, but we cannot. But, uh, we can actually produce uh, barley sprout very easily in the indoor vertical farm. And barley sprout ha has very good nutrition for the cattle. And then also it's much cheaper than alfalfa. And then also there are many uh, research done on mixing barley sprout to uh, TMR, the animal feed, can improve uh, the productivity. One research says, uh, the, the meat, the, the weight growth of the, the beef can uh, be quicker uh, more than two times. And then the, the quality of uh, meat can improve. For the, the cow milk, cow, uh, the milk cows, the milk production can improve by 20%. And then the protein content in the milk can also improve. So, we are actually working with uh, one of the, the local company in uh, Abu Dhabi to you know, develop the, the barley sprout uh, into a vertical farm, and then we want to conduct uh, research uh, with uh, the, the cattle company as well. Let me <clears throat> and then, you know, uh, today the UAE minister actually mentioned about uh, the agriculture consumes the most uh, resources. I think that's really true. Uh, I heard 70% of fresh water are wasted or used in uh, agriculture. You know, it's very simple. If you give water to the plants, 95% of water just disappears. It's only less than 5% of water is actually consumed by a uh, plant. But uh, controlled environment agriculture, 
we use uh, less than 5% of water used by uh, traditional agriculture. And then, uh, you know, we can also recycle the water, so the water consumption is very low. And another statistic says 30% uh, of uh, the agricultural land disappeared in the past, uh, I think, 30 years. But in uh, controlled environment agriculture, we don't uh, make land, uh, you know, bad. And then we can actually uh, increase the productivity of, uh, you know, agriculture by, uh, you know, six times, eight times, ten times. Basically, we can actually stack up the, the layers. Then we can uh, produce much more uh, product. And another good uh, side of uh, controlled environment agriculture is no pesticides used. Typically, I believe six billion tons of uh, pesticides are used in uh, agriculture but uh, we don't use uh, any uh, pesticides. And in terms of uh, the, the waste of uh, food, only 67% of uh, you know, the, the crops harvested in traditional uh, agriculture can be edible. So almost like one third, you, know, you cannot eat. But the, the crops from uh, Indoor Vertical Farm the rate goes up to 97%. So we, we don't uh, waste anything. And 45% of uh, fresh vegetables are wasted uh, during the transportation. And then 40, about 50% uh, of uh, also the, the fresh vegetables are wasted because uh, you know, it doesn't the supply chain issue as well. But by producing uh, you know, the, the, the crops locally and then uh, reducing uh, food miles, you don't, you're not going to have this kind of waste. And in addition to saving the waste, you know, we can produce uh, the vegetables uh, throughout the year, uh, three, 365 days a year, and then the productivity rate is uh, at least uh, two times faster than uh, traditional agriculture. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, if you look at countries like, uh, you know, Singapore, they also want to do, uh, you know, the food, uh, self-sufficient food supply within Singapore. But they have very uh, limited land. One of the benefits of, uh, you know, indoor vertical farm is we can actually do agriculture anywhere, any place in the city. So one example is, uh, the metro farm in uh, Seoul. So we actually converted unused space in Korean Seoul metro station into a smart farm. So I, I actually wanted to show the picture, but when we think about uh, changing that place, that place was completely empty, it's dead space, but uh, we revived that space into you know, indoor vertical farm with a salad cafe, and then also we develop, uh, you know, the agriculture academy for uh, kindergarten uh, kids. And also with the Singapore uh, Food Agency, we have been discussing about, uh, you know, using the land below the, the underpass. Because uh, below the underpass, there is no sunlight, so that land is completely wasted. But we are actually utilizing that land for uh, indoor vertical farm. And another uh, project currently being uh, discussed is, you know, developing indoor vertical farm in Manhattan, right? The, the vegetable price in New Jersey versus uh, Manhattan, the Manhattan is typically uh, 2.5 to 3 times higher than the, the price of uh, vegetables in New Jersey. That's because uh, the transportation costs from New Jersey to uh, New York. There is only one route you can transport uh, vegetable to Manhattan, which is the, the George Washington uh, Bridge. And then, you know, after the pandemic, there are lots of empty spaces in the buildings of Manhattan. So, uh, excuse me, Mr. Park, could, could I kindly ask you to conclude uh, this series of uh, very exciting projects? Yeah. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Last few so words. So Manhattan uh, is another one. So we want to make self-sustainable, uh, you know, farm uh, with the, the restaurant. 
uh, connecting to the, the, the farm as well. But, uh, you know, the, the CEA also has uh, many, uh, you know, issues because uh, we are being criticized uh, with using uh, lots of energy. But I believe uh, uh, we can solve that pro problem because the, one of the things we are currently focusing on is the consumption of uh, energy in our LED lights. And for example, we were able to reduce uh, the power consumption by 10% every year. So Park, could I kindly ask you to, so that we, yeah. th thank you, thank you very much. I think the, the list of examples that you have been giving uh, is incredibly, uh, is incredibly uh, stunning and uh, highlights how much productivity can be increased and also uh, all the extreme conditions or frontier conditions in which uh, food can be produced efficiently with economic models that, that are viable. So, and uh, all the examples that you have given are also uh, leading me to uh, go back to one word that you, Mr. Kamel, mentioned, was, that was alternative proteins. So, uh, alternative proteins is uh, meat without uh, cows, you know, uh, including up to uh, uh, 3D printing, etc. So I know there's a lot of curiosity about this issue. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask all of you uh, in two minutes each, uh, whether you think this is a possible solution for uh, the future of food, not only as a tiny niche uh, uh, area, but something that could really be a uh, full-scale uh, solution. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Cullen, if you have uh, correctly uh, heard me, and if you'd like to start, you know, really two, two, two three minutes uh, each, just giving a feeling about what is, you know, something that for everybody is uh, absolutely beyond <laughs> understanding to up to a certain extent. Please, if you can ref uh, tell me again what is the solution you're referring to. Uh, I, I cannot hear you correctly. I uh, I, I'm you asking whether you think that alternative proteins uh, can be uh, a, a full-scale solution for nutrition and not only uh, some kind of uh, niche uh, scientific uh, experiment. Sure. Okay. So, look, I... I I don't think is the only solution that we have to look at okay? because the, the importance here is that it's not just proteins but it's other elements that are required in a nutritious diet and a healthy diet. And when we look at all the rest of animals, for example, there is a diversity of micronutrients that are provided which are important. I think the challenge on the other side is how we are able to balance things, because we have countries that overconsume proteins and countries which are completely under-consuming protein. If we are able to achieve that balance, I think we can bring that solution which is more efficient and could resolve significant problems of under-consumption of proteins we have, and at the same time cope with uh, greenhouse gas emissions, especially related to livestock uh, production. So, is one element which could contribute, but I don't see it as an overall solution to the challenge. So there are alternative solutions to alternative proteins. Okay. Mr. Kamal, would like to continue? Yeah, first, uh, this is relatively in, in new area. I mean, it's only on the last five, six years. I think everybody tried the Impossible Burger and another uh, similar product. It's here to stay. We are still at the pre-paradigm era. We don't have a clear way of how to do it. And more important, we don't have assurance of the health and safety long-term benefits uh, associated with it. But if you think of life on Mars, for example, and here we always say in the desert in Egypt, uh, we are reclaiming Mars because we don't have water, we don't have soil, uh, we don't have electricity, what have you. If you think of life on Mars, let's say, of course you will be using what you call uh, food in the lab. Uh, uh, so I believe it's here to stay, it will grow, it's important. Definitely continuing to have more and more cows and more and more gas emissions uh, as a source of us uh, getting uh, meat is not going to be sustainable. 
and we have to wait uh, to see what will happen. But it will go mainstream in another couple of, couple of years, I believe. Already major, major investments are done there, and uh, we'll have to see yet the economic return. Still, there is no positive economic return on this, but I think it will continue to, to happen. So, Kulehi? Yeah, I think so as well. I think that um, alternative proteins would, uh, at the moment it is niche, and perhaps it will continue to be niche until it is no longer uh, a niche. And perhaps what would help it to not become, uh, not continue to be niche is technology, it's, it's research. Uh, this evokes, for example, the question that uh, many years ago was at the point of uh, debate with regards to technology and is genetically, uh, genetically modified uh, foods, for example. Before now, there was a lot of debate about the health uh, benefits or the health implications of uh, genetically modified foods. But today, food technology has shown us that it is not only possible, but possible to do it safely to fortify foods with the nutrients that are, are required, whether they are uh, proteins or vitamins or as the case may be. So with regards to whether uh, alternative proteins will be able to provide at scale the kinds of uh, 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 benefits that we need in order to, to, to make it economically viable is, is still questionable. But I think what is encouraging is that it's becoming more and more possible with technology, with science, uh, to fortify with more nutrients what we, we consume uh, already. But it's definitely a, uh, a very interesting topic that should be on the, on the table of both public and private sector. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah. Mr. Park, would yeah, you concur? I, I, I agree. Like, theoretically, you know, almost everything is possible, right? Like, uh, you know, the fortifying uh, vegetables, you know, it's possible. And then we can also, uh, you know, modify the taste of the uh, vegetables, right? If uh, in certain region, they produce uh, best carrot, then we can study, you know, the, the, the land and then the climate of the region. And we can mimic the same condition in the indoor vertical farm and we can produce uh, same type of uh, food. But, you know, we still need, uh, you know, long way to go, but, uh, as uh, you know, all the technology develops, it starts with the niche, and then it becomes uh, the main uh, technology. So I think uh, it's not going to solve all the problem, but uh, it could be a big part of the, the solving problem of food in the future. OK, so I understand that you are cautious, but rather positive. But if, if I could summarize this kind of feeling. Now, maybe let, let's turn to the room, to the audience. Uh, would there be uh, questions, comments? Uh, Philippe, you would like, Mrs. Kwon? Uh, uh, yeah. May I say I'm a bit surprised? Uh, because in listening to you, I had the impression that the food problem was just a technological one. And with some money uh, invested in the private sector, there wouldn't be any more food problem. Uh, you didn't speak about one individual called the farmer. Neither, perhaps a bit, our friend from Nigeria, did you speak about uh, public policies. May I remind you that in the 30s, Europe was a net food importer. That in the 50s, the PL 480 was created in the United States to send food aid, especially grains, to India. That very India, which is now threatening uh, the uh, food markets with the embargo because they are exporter of rice, of sugar, of wheat. Uh, where are the successes of Europe over India? Perhaps technologies, yes, but at first it was public policies, the common agricultural policy in Europe. And what is uh, not enough studied uh, the Indian agricultural policy with a guarantee of remunerative prices for farmers. Don't you think this is 
this thing, which is important, that's true that Africa is dependent, is importing Nigeria. You're the world's biggest uh, with Egypt. In fact, uh, Nigeria and Egypt, you're the world's biggest wheat importer. In the 50s, Nigeria was the net food exporter. You were the biggest uh, exporter of palm oil, if, if I remember. So don't you think that the first problem is a problem of public policy, of uh, agricultural policies, and unfortunately, in some of your countries, farmers don't vote, or their political power is fairly limited. Well understood. The, re the rebellion of public policy, Philippe. Uh, yeah, so let me ask yeah. you, let me, before you... Because Maybe I'm going to ask Mrs. Ah. Korn also to intervene, because we don't have much time left, and then all of you will get a chance to uh, uh, conclude. Mrs. Korn? Certainly, I feel. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, for, thank you very much for sharing uh, with us your very extraordinary activities. And after uh, Mr. Uh, Shalman's uh, question, I feel certainly, you know, my question <laughs> is not very, very important. But um, I personally uh, convinced. I'm convinced that uh, the technology is really uh, one of the very important solution uh, to the problem of uh, our food insecurity issue. And, and especially just for that, I have a small question to Mr. Park. And I'm uh, personally very, very uh, fascinated uh, by this um, uh, smart farm technology. But, you know, as a, a, a one of the person who uh, like very much to eat very uh, good food, uh, my concern is, you know, all products from a smart farm, uh, do you think uh, uh, they can contain the same uh, nutritional quality or taste? Yeah. Okay, so again, <laughs> Who would, yeah. you know, good. I think there's a third question, if you, if you want uh, to take uh, all the questions. Unfortunately, very quickly, please, madam. Yeah, it's very please short. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Yes, I was just surprised to hear uh, that uh, genetically modified uh, GMOs, what it's all, the GMOs are sort of uh, normalized now because they appear to be safe. What is that? Uh, is there something official about that now? And uh, they are normally the, uh, the World Organization, Monsieur is here, maybe he will confirm, has not uh, really approved that. So can you give clarity on that issue? Thank you. OK, fine. Thank you very much. So GMO, oh. maybe two minutes each, yeah, so that minutes. we stick uh, into our time frame. Mr. Park, if you wish so, to start. I, I think the, what, uh, the method we use in indoor vertical farm or controlled uh, you know, environment agriculture is different from like uh, GMO. So we don't do any, uh, you know, the fabrication uh, to the, the crops. The only thing we do is we basically use water and nutrient, and we don't use soil. Soil is actually something it can hold the crops, but we use some other uh, methodology to hold the, the crops, and then basically feeding uh, nutrient. So when I say, you know, the theoretically uh, modifying the taste or the ingredients, it's mainly done by controlling uh, climate. So, for example, the, the Korean strawberry is very sweet. If you try Korean strawberry, the, the sweetness is more, twice more than the, the strawberry in the uh, U.S. They are typically grown in you know, the traditional uh, the, the greenhouse. The reason Korean strawberry is uh, sweet is not because it's modified. It's because of the, the temperature difference between the, during the daytime and during the nighttime. So the, that's the techniques we are using it. When I say controlling the climate, so if you want to make strawberry sweeter, then you, know, you, you can control the, the difference in the temperature. Some of the... Uh, thank the, you, Mr. Farber. Yeah, Unfortunately, two, two everybody seconds, has seconds. to get a chance. So very quickly, 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, two two seconds. Like, some of the, the crops with high uh, the, 
the functional ingredients. It's all, also done by uh, you know, changing the, the light and then changing the temperature. You know, we don't do any modification. And normally the, the crops we produce has the same nutrient as the crops produced in the, the traditional farming. Thank you very much, Mr. Park. Uh, Mr. Huli, uh, uh, one First, last question? The, the question from uh, uh, Madame Biloa. I think that, uh, again, science has, has helped to demystify uh, a lot of things. And there is genetically modified food, and there is today the improvement, for example, in seedling or in the, the makeup of, of, uh, of, of food that, that creates better yield, for example. I'll give you an instance. Uh, I own an agriculture business and we supply the supermarket chains in, in Nigeria. And today, with science, with you know, uh, better seedling, uh, you're able to produce in a 200,000 meters greenhouse controlled environment agriculture situation more food uh, to supply the supermarket chains than we were able to do in 200 hectares of you know, open air farmland uh, today. There, what is important in all of this is the safety and health and how to prove the safety of the, the seedlings that we use to produce uh, food today. And I think that the issue of GMO is still one of those issues that are out there. I don't know what the official policy uh, uh, on them is, but certainly science has helped to prove that some of the practices that were yesterday seen as taboo are actually uh, uh, safe today. With regards to the question over there, yes, it starts with policy. And this is very ironical, especially for us coming from, from Africa. Um, many, many years ago, Nigeria gave the first uh, palm uh, seedling or palm uh, uh, um, uh, trees to Malaysia, and today the reverse is the case where palm oil is imported from Malaysia into Nigeria. Very sad situation, but yes, it starts from public policy, from governments realizing that uh, there is a big impact in not doing anything, and there is a big impact in doing something, and coupled to that is that private sector starts to see the economic benefit of making sure that there is resilience around supply chains. Today you have a lot of uh, uh, the, the meals, the, the flour meals, for example, uh, in Africa, starting to see that you have all of these machinery and production lines, but you need supply chain um, uh, 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 contribution from places like Ukraine, for example, to, to get wheat, uh, you know, to make sure that the, the factories are running. The more these people start, the more the private sector starts to realize the impact of this, then maybe the hands of uh, governments are forced with regards to public policy. But spot on, it's, uh, it, it's the truth. Mr. Uh, this is a very important area you raised. Uh, at Canal Sugar, we work with 6,000 farmers. We'll reach about 20,000 farmers within three more years. You are right. Uh, the farmers do all the work, and they get maybe 10 cents on the dollar from anything that's done. If there is uh, food waste uh, due to supply chain, the farmer is the, uh, he or she, and mostly it's she, the farmers. People think of farmers, they're only men, mostly they're women. They're the ones uh, who suffer. When it comes to public policy, people and agriculture, people forget the Treaty of Rome before the EU was probably in the beginning purely an agriculture uh, project. Uh, the farmers are suffering all over the world. One of the issues is the, uh, uh, lack of development in the public policy format, in the legislation format. They don't have access to legal papers for their land, so they cannot get financing for, for the land because generally it's the land is given or inherited or is owned by several people. So they have to go to the industry, the other part of private sector who will charge them so much uh, for uh, ensuring funding. And then the same thing on access to technology and access to, to seeds and, and what have you. Uh, you are right that uh, this is, uh, this is a, a shame that agriculture remains as part of the GDPs of most countries relatively much smaller than other parts, uh, the other sectors. And you are, you are spot on. The farmer is now an educated person. And sooner or later, if he or she will not vote with their, with their uh, electrical vote, they will vote with, uh, in different ways. And it could become a ticking, uh, a ticking, a ticking bomb. So uh, 
Uh, I appreciated the, the question. We didn't address it in our presentation because that wasn't part of our brief on discussion. But we would need a quick uh, update of public uh, policy, of environmental, of legislature uh, changes that will cater to the, uh, the traditional farmer. What we do is mechanized farming, which is different, but we will not be successful without working with the traditional farmers. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kamel. And, uh, uh, yes, 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 I'm not forgetting you because I'm sure that uh, as an as FAO official and senior official, you would be very happy to address the issue of public policy. No, sure. Thank you so much. And, uh, and look, at, I, I refer to many issues related to policy. For example, the, the repurposing agenda is completely really linked to policies linked to the information of the true cost accounting, which will be modifying significantly the way we align policies. But also, when we talk about innovation and science, which is central, uh, it's one of the elements that we need to accelerate together with data, but also with institutions. A, new, a good policy of innovation and science requires policies behind to set them up, requires institutions in place. If not, it will be very complex. But for sure, uh, everything that we have been talking, at least everything that I talk, is linked to, to, to the design and policies, but we need to be careful not to bring distortive policies that could have worked in the past, but not necessarily will work today. We are in a different environment, and we need to be very careful not to create new distortion. Second, I, I think it's important uh, to correct some issues. Uh, Biofertification cannot happen, does not in increase nutrition capacity. The only way you can increase nutrition capacity of a crop is through biotechnology, which is not biofortification. And the other element which was uh, wrong, uh, GMOs are not accepted and generalized, of course not. GMOs are, are managed and decided by each country, uh, and there is a lot of scientific evidence behind them, especially more than GMOs on gene editing today, uh, but this is country by country decision and the institutions and regulations have to be in place in each of, of the countries. So, so we need to be careful uh, with that. And even in Europe, of course, uh, GMOs are not there, and uh, there is still discussions on gene editing. So again, there is a lot of evidence already in place that we need to bring to inform people, but we need to assess all the different elements. And finally, on the on the control environments, horizontal and vertical, so you can have control environments horizontally and vertically. Horizontal have been cost effective. UAE is an extreme example because it's very costly to produce food in the UAE, but they are profitable in China, Vietnam, Singapore. It's very profitable. Vertical farming is also starting to be profitable in terms of control environments. There are very good examples in China and Singapore and other regions of the world. So again, it's a way to satisfy food for the urban areas because you get closer to them in terms of production of vegetables and other high value commodities. And that is not GMOs, that is not a biotechnology. It's basically it's a high level precision agriculture to manage properly micronutrients to the, to the plants and, and water provision and of course uh, uh, the heat that is needed. So again, it's, it's a technological innovation when you are in the high end of high value commodities which is starting to be evolving rapidly and to make give access to urban, especially for uh, households. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Cullen. We are, we are now, for these very interesting comments, we are now at the end of the session. I just would like to add, as personally, that I've spent uh, uh, now at least three decades of my professional life uh, supporting governments, for establishing uh, public agricultural policies in developing countries, uh, in Asia, in Africa, etc. And uh, it's uh, building on uh, Philippe's uh, comment, it's of course a sobering situation to see that in many developing countries, not all, of course, but in many developing countries, agriculture uh, has a much lower share of uh, budget, investment, and policy attention than it should if we wanted to address all the issues that we have here. So that's a reason for which I'm particularly uh, grateful uh, to the WPC, uh, Thierry, Mrs. Kwan, for insisting on having this discussion on agriculture, because it's not, all, all, it's not only about discussing the substance, but also just per se, because there's discussion uh, around it, and whatever we say, 
that it shows the importance that it has in the global agenda, an importance which is really uh, underestimated by uh, many uh, policy players. So uh, thank you very much for allowing us to uh, have this type of discussion. Continuing, maybe if there is another discussion next year, trying to deepen even more uh, some of these uh, policy dimensions at the global level, but also at the national level. Uh, level and trying to dig into this, this agenda. Now, I think that all of you will have recognized that we had uh, an, an, uh, a fantastic group to address those issues uh, on the screen and in the room, and that they have uh, enlightened us uh, with their vision on policies, private uh, investments and, and initiatives, uh, science, uh, that uh, opening new doors into our vision. So please uh, applaud them and thank them. <laughs>